Tonight's episode of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show is brought to you by Kid Products, stick stoves and reflector ovens proudly made in Canada. Algonquin Outfitters, with five key locations in and around Algonquin Park to serve your backcountry needs. Salus Marine, keeping you safe on the water since 1999. Ostrom Outdoors, custom fit canoe packs and barrel harnesses. Badger Paddles, handcrafted canoe paddles made to order. And Novicraft Canoes, connecting you with nature in Canadian-made canoes since 1970. Well, happy Tuesday evening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show, a show that brings you a lot closer to the great outdoors. My name's Dennis, also known as Canoe Hound, and if this is your first time tuning into uh, the show, well, thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully, uh, we'll do enough tonight to make you a believer, a subscriber, and a thumbs up her uh we got a good show ahead of you ahead of us tonight uh but uh as per usual we will get on with a few announcements before uh we get into speaking with tonight's guest uh that gives us the opportunity for that live chat over there to fill up uh, a lot of people come straggling in a little late and that's all right because they know i do these uh these little announcement bits anyways uh let's see here I usually start with, uh, if you missed ha happened to miss last week's show, well, that's because there wasn't a show last week. Uh, sorry for that there, but we had a family engagement, had to uh, take care of that. And I do take family uh, family over Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure show any time of the day. So uh, hopefully you understand that and that uh, that doesn't become a problem. But anyways, if you missed the show that we had before that, uh, we had four different guests on and we were talking about the allure of paddling in the Yukon. Uh, a lot of people are flocking to the Yukon right now in search of adventure. Uh, uh, just All you need to do is watch YouTube and uh, some of their, your favorite YouTubers and you can see how many are actually flocking up there for uh, different river trips uh, in, in such a remote area. So uh, that's always a good thing. And whenever I do a show like that, it's usually something where I'm doing a little bit of research for myself. So I learned an awful lot. Uh, especially from uh, Mark from Up North Adventures. He's one of the outfitters up in, um, I believe it's Whitehorse. And he uh, he knows his stuff. He's uh, he, he can really give you some great direction when it comes to uh, your planning of a trip up there. So by all means, if you ever uh, think about pa uh, planning a trip into Yukon, come on back, watch that episode if you missed it, or re-watch it if, uh, if you did watch it to see what you may have missed. But uh, you know what? It's a it's a great way to uh, to do some planning when it comes to uh, your trip in the Yukon if that's going to happen. So, yes, for sure. Uh, next week's show, just to uh, let you know, we will be joined by Mitch Azaria, uh, who's the producer of the TVO original Tripping the French River. Uh, for any of you that might be familiar with the Tripping series on TVO, basically they're like uh, hour and forty five to three hour long videos, and they they cover different things. Uh, one of my favorite ones that I could, you can watch on YouTube is uh, tripping with tra or tripping the tri tripping with train one eighty five, and that's basically it's a uh, documentary on um, the bud the bud train that goes from Sudbury to White River, I believe it is. Uh, something I've been on a few times, and it's really cool. They just show you all the history points. They talk about all different aspects of uh, of the route, um, you know, how it come to be and things of that sort. But uh, they have they have several of these tripping type of videos. One's tripping uh, the Niagara River. I just watched the other one the other day, tripping the Redoux Canal. 
uh, and now they're doing this one tripping the French River, and it's a great way to gain a lot of information on the French if you're planning a trip on the French River. Uh, that particular episode on TVO is looking to air on Sunday, April 21st, and it'll also be airing here on YouTube and a couple of other platforms. So uh, if you want more information on that, you'll have to watch the show next week uh, with uh, me and Mitch. So it should be a good time. And I have to thank tonight's guest, too, because he kind of set this up. Uh, not only is he tonight's guest, but he also uh, made the connection between me and the producer of uh, of, of that particular show. So uh, thank you very much to him. Uh, of course, our channel member shout out. Uh, we'll get our, some of my favorite people down here floating across the bottom. These are all supporters of the channel. They're channel members. Uh, thank you to all of you. We do have a few members that are celebrating some uh, milestones with their uh, channel memberships. Uh, let's see here. At uh, 36 months, we have Jay's Way and Norma Lynn. 36 months. That's three whole years. Wow. Thank you. Uh, celebrating 24 months, we have Randy Greenall. And then at 12 months, we have uh, Maurice Poulin. Uh, he is from the uh, the Friends of Wabakimi. And you'll hear a little bit more about Maurice in a few minutes because you know, we'll, you'll see when, I, when we get there. But uh, to anybody that may be considering uh, consider considering becoming a channel member, there's a join button down here. Feel free to click on that at any time. You'll see uh, what all is involved with becoming a channel member and how it supports the channel. Um, because believe it or not, there are costs incurred with doing this, right? So, uh, but it's with the help of these people down here that all of you get to see this show. And uh, yeah. If you do become a channel member, make sure you drop me your email address or your, your contact information by email so we can get everything going, your perks, stickers, or whatever it might be. <clears throat> also, uh, I'd like to thank our Buy Me a Coffee uh, peeps. We have uh, Steve Pogue and uh, Beauty of the Backcountry. Thank you very much for your coffee contribution. Let's take a dip, everybody. Not sure what everybody's drinking out there, but tonight I got a nice uh, black coffee going. That's a... Uh, Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, some birthday announcements. We have uh, quite a few to announce. Uh, this week, um, he already celebrated because it happened a few days ago. Randy Mitson, he was a, a, a past manager um, or marketing manager for Algonquin Outfitters. And good buddy, happy uh, birthday to you there, Randy. Uh, Kim Switzer, he's also cel celebrated a birthday back here on April the 6th. Uh, Eric Tosser, uh, his birthday is today. He's a sidekick of the Northern Scavengers. You might have seen him in one of their uh, their series there. Uh, Maurice Poulin, who I just mentioned a few mo moments ago, celebrating a uh, milestone with uh, channel membership. His birthday is coming up on April the 13th. And, of course, Darren Bush, who's the organizer of Canoe Copia, his birthday is also on April the 13th. So happy birthdays to all of you. I uh, hope you all had a good day or going to have a good day. So uh, let's make the best of it. If anybody has a uh, an event coming up that they'd like to announce on the show here, drop me an email here at canoehound at gmail.com, and I would uh, be more than happy to make that happen for you. Also, if you have any ideas uh, for any shows throughout the rest of the season, we are getting close to the wind-down period. Uh, the, the, this season five will end uh, sometime in late May. So that gives us maybe another six or seven shows uh, to put together, and most of them are already booked. So uh, it's going to be a great ending to a, uh, a fantastic season. So, But you know what? For future, it's always great to have uh, more ideas. So please send them my way and let me know what you'd love to see on the show. Anyways, without uh, – oh, I had one other thing here. This is really cool. Uh, I had a, uh, a viewer um, – send me a really cool contraption here uh this here i don't i don't often do this where i'm promoting something on the show or anything like that but this is sent to me and i think this is really going to make my life a lot easier on uh on new trips it's called a portage pal and i don't know just by looking at it here if you could figure out what it does but basically it's a really cool handle and it's got a couple straps on it and you would wrap these straps around your your paddle and your fishing pole or, or something along that lines uh, when you're getting ready for your portage, and it gives you a nice little handle to walk the portage with. Uh, me, I'm always fumbling, or I, I've been trying for years different straps and Velcro and stuff like this. Uh, I think 
Portage Pal has this whole thing figured out. Um, I'm looking forward to trying this here, uh, probably on my spring ice out trip. Mind you, that's going to be late. But anyways, uh, I'm really looking forward to trying this out on the trail, see how that's going to be on the Portage, and uh, maybe make my life a little bit easier. Super lightweight, and you can check them out at uh, Portage Pal. Uh, shout out to them, portagepal.com or .ca. You go ahead and uh, have a look. And they also are selling these in some uh, retail stores. I know our local store, Outdoors Oriented, I know they carry them there. So uh, I think Josh is the fellow's name that's uh, that's producing these. So good work, Josh. Good stuff. Thinking outside the box. That's what I like to see. No affiliation, no sponsorship, by the way. But one thing he did send me a spare one that will be part of a giveaway here uh within the next couple of weeks so stay tuned for that all righty let's get on with uh tonight's uh guest uh been looking forward to this here it's been kind of bounced around a little bit this show and thanks for his understanding in uh rescheduling a couple of times including last week uh which uh was supposed to happen but uh tonight we're joined by a youtube friend and adventure uh, i'm sure many of you follow him he has a real passion for paddling, especially when it comes to whitewater. He's a self-proclaimed, he self-proclaimed he's in love with whitewater paddling. I, I've seen that in one of his videos. Uh, he's collaborated on YouTube videos with people like Xander Budnick, uh, Ben Beauchamp, and others. Uh, and over the past several months, he's become a rambling man. And he's been traveling uh, the Southwest, the Midwest of the, the United States in search of new adventure. Please welcome to the live stream we have. Richard Tosh from Tosh Self Propelled, but we're just going to call him Tosh, right? Everybody does. <laughs> Everybody does. Everybody does. Yeah. yeah does the unless, Bollywood uh, people call you by your first name? Uh, unless we're related, probably not. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, man, tell tell us a little for for those that are not familiar with you, tell tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, we'll get into talking about some of your canoe tripping stuff before we get into your your van life that you have going on now. So, Oh, I'll tell you about myself. Um, so I, well, I'm in the van now. Uh, there's no secret. I'm, I'm sitting in the van, uh, sitting here on a, a lovely, I don't know if you can see a street corner here in, uh, in Ottawa. Um, but yeah, I have been paddling most of my life and outdoors, camping, canoeing, fishing, hunting, all that. I uh, grew up doing all that. And then spent about 10 years in the military and then the last few years kind of wobbling around after I got out of the army. And now I'm, I'm living on four wheels, well, six wheels and on the road. Six wheels. That's right. Cause you're, 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 you're <laughs> band of the dually, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the big yeah cool. Okay. Heavy duty. You got to get back there into the back country. Yeah. So. You, you say you've been uh, you've been canoeing like for for most of your life. When to take us back into young Tosh, you know, uh, do, do you remember one of your first outings in a canoe trip? I, I vividly remember my first canoe trip, and it was a complete disaster. Um, my dad decided he wanted to go spring brook trout fishing, and I guess my mom said, you know, you can go, but you have to take some of the kids with you. I have an older sister and a younger brother. And so my dad took my sister and I, and this would have been like, I don't know, probably early May. And we were so woefully unprepared. This is the mid, like mid eighties, uh, a giant canvas tent that leaked like a sieve. We had no rain gear and it poured rain for three days. No uh, we ended up, we ended up coming out early with, like wearing the garbage bags that our sleeping bags have been packed in. And I, I can remember going across the portage carrying this, you know, giant tent, like a handful of firewood and just being in a garbage bag soaked to the skin. And, uh, yeah, my dad, you know, he, he wanted to go fishing. And <laughs> so that was the price he had to pay. And I, I don't know what it was, but, Something about the freedom of being out there, I, I fell in love with. And every time he ever said you want to go fishing or camping or hunting ever again, I was, you know, first in line. And I didn't realize it until obviously much later in life how fortunate I was growing up with my dad and all of his brothers. And then all my mom's family was very uh, much into, you know, hunting, fishing mostly and a bit of 
a bit of camping if it led to fishing and whatever. They'd really like to go out and, and harvest something, but that just laid the foundation for me as a kid is like, I just loved being outside. I grew up right on Georgian Bay. And so okay. I was out in the lake all the time and swimming. We all, my brother and sister and I all grew up to be lifeguards and um, work teaching swimming for years. And so it just, it snowballed. And then I spent 10 years in the military and uh, in the infantry and you got to like being outside if you want to be in the infantry. Right. Right. So, so being brought up around Georgia Bay, you know, so many kids nowadays are, are so unfortunate when it comes to that because they spend all their time inside on video games when they, you know, when we were younger and I'm old, much older than you, I'd, I'd imagine. But uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, my parents never seen me. I was out all the time. In fact, they'd have to come looking for me to get me back into the house because I was yeah. on my bike out in the forest building trail or building you know, forts or, you know, jumping ramps on bikes and stuff like that. And, and nowadays, you know, the, the kids are, they're doing this or, or they're, you know, they're, they're just into the phones all the time. Right. And it's, yeah, it's kind of scary, yeah. you know, how many kids are actually going to be doing what we're doing unless we break them into it. Right. That's it. That's where I think I was so fortunate where I had my uncles that were my dad who was willing to, you know, take this, you know, snot nosed kid dragging his feet everywhere. And, you know, we're going fishing, you're, you know, and put up with me doing that. But, um, there was a lot of patience on their part, uh, you know, untangling fishing lines and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But I was always encouraged to, to get out of the house. You know, if we sat in front of the TV for too long, my mom would just unplug the TV and tell us to get outside. And, you know, we'd spend hours in Georgian Bay and, I can remember we lived, I think we were the third house from the water. Yeah. Oh, three wow. houses between us and Georgian Bay on a dead end street. And my mom would just come out and stand on the porch and just yell, supper's ready. And she just yell it three or four times. And we were expected to wherever we were, um, get home for supper. Right. Yeah. Stop, <laughs> so, drop and, then, and run. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, and if, if if we didn't show up within about five minutes, she'd just come out on the deck and start yelling again. And then, yeah. you know, if it happened a third time, we were probably going to get in trouble for being too far away from home. But uh, I always remember getting, you know, in trouble for more for being in the house than being outside. Right. Uh, That's cool. And then, yeah, once I got into high school, I don't know if my buddy Rob is on here in the chat somewhere, but he's probably watching. Um. In high school, Rob and I sat one seat in front of each other uh, in grade 10 math class. And mm -hmm. we would spend the entire math period just planning where we wanted to go camping on the weekend. And we'd make gear lists. And I I almost failed that year in math. and uh, But we went camping literally every weekend from September. You know, every weekend that was available. Even in the wintertime, we'd hike up on the Bruce Trail along Blue Mountain, snowshoe in and set up a tent and just, you know, try and make one match fires and all kinds of little silly games we'd play. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my parents never had a problem. We were you know, 14 years old. Like, here's some snowshoes in the backpack. See you on Sunday night. <laughs> Get lost, eh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, yeah, that's, uh, you know, with with all the things that happen in society now, I, I remember down, down here in Niagara and it, it is, it made worldwide news was that, uh, that Kristen French abduction, uh, the mm -hmm. Bernard, whole Bernardo thing. Yeah. And that was like quite literally in my wife's backyard. Eh? But that there changed so much in this area where all of a sudden kids like myself, back when I was a kid, I, I never got a ride to school. You know what I mean? It was like, you walked to school. I, I was I was too close for a bus, but too far for a ride. You know what I mean? It, it, it was yeah. one of those things. Never, ever, ever did I ever get a ride to school, right? A after all that stuff happened there, before you knew it, parents were taking their kids everywhere. They were like, you know, they're just attached at, you know, attached at the hip yeah. because nobody trusts society anymore, right? And that, that's a shame because, you know, in, in today's society, like, you know, your mom lets you, she encourages you, get out there, go, here's the snowshoes and here's a backpack and we'll see you, see you on Monday mm. or Sunday night, right? 
I, yeah. I don't know if that happens so much these days anymore. Yeah, I can remember when that happened. And my sister's two years older. And I know things changed for her. My parents were obviously more cautious uh, with her at the time, just with, you know, wanting her to check in more often. Nobody had cell phones. So if you were out somewhere, you had to have a, a quarter in your pocket. Or I can remember calling. You'd find a, a, a pay phone and I'd be at school. And, you know, I have a, a basketball practice or something. And so practice was ending early and I'd call my mom, but we would call collect all the time. And so when you'd answer the phone from Bell, it would say, you have a collect call from, and then you were supposed to say your name. And we would always just like blurt into the phone, mom, pick me up at school. And then we'd hang up. <laughs> and so that's how my mom knew to get, and we'd get around, with, get around spending a quarter that way. Yeah, yeah. How <laughs> to scam Bell Telephony? Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. So, when when did you? Uh, how old were you when you did your first solo trip or your first outing with your buddy? Was that like grade ten, as you were mentioning? Um, I think probably it was grade nine or grade ten. The first time I went camping without an adult. Yeah. And then, you know, Rob and I camped together a lot, and. I know I, as a, when I was younger, I, you know, slept out in the backyard by myself or whatever it was in a tent. And, um, we would go to summer camp every year, like a family summer camp. And my mom, my dad would take us for two weeks and drop us off and he would just come back on the weekends. And my mm -hmm. mom, we were there with another family. So both moms would stay in the, the camper and all the kids were in tents outside. And so we'd all sleep out there together. And so it wasn't a big deal to spend the night in a tent. But I don't really recall when my first real solo camping trip was, but probably around there, grade 10, grade 11, something like that. Yeah. And then what about canoeing? When, when did you really get into canoeing? Was it something, did you, your parents have a canoe at home or anything like that? Or Yeah, we had a couple. My, my, one of my dad, my dad has seven brothers and one of his older brothers, uh, my uncle Dave, I would say was the big influence in paddling for me. Um, I've talked about him a few times on video and he was the first one who ever took me on a river trip. He introduced me to white water. He introduced me to Bill Mason. Like we would, I would get to his house on a, the, the Friday night or a Thursday night, whatever it was of a long weekend, we were going to go up to Sudbury and we'd do a canoe trip in the area. And he would, everybody that was going on the trip, okay, everyone in the basement. And he'd put on path of the paddle mm -hmm. and he would make us all sit through it and he'd say, okay, see how he's doing that. See how you find the rock there and see how he's, you know, moving the canoe. And he'd try and teach us some stuff like that. And then the next morning we'd all load up and get driven off by one of my other uncles and he'd drop us off somewhere and we'd be on, you know, the Sturgeon or the Wanapate or the Spanish or some river up there. And then it was just a complete gong show of, you know, flipping canoes yeah. and rapids and, you know, and, <laughs> Um, I, I pinned a canoe in a rapid, I think the first year I went on the one of the day, um, kind of semi wrapped it around and it was an old Coleman Ramex that we'd smashed the gunnels all off and ended up having to stomp it back into shape and, you know, duct tape it back together to get us back home again. But like so many good times, like Dave was a huge influence to me. Um, he passed away from cancer back in 2000. And that year, I did a big solo trip. Um, so I did 28 days by myself, did the entire length of the Wanapate River, and then it was, came down the Wanapate where it joins the French at Wanapate Bay. And then I went all the way up the French and back down again. Um, mm -hmm. Did a big loop on there. But yeah, he was the big influence. He was just obsessed with paddling. He loved it. Oh, that's cool. So now when it, when it comes to all that there, uh, you're, you're older now, obviously you, you've, you've grown <laughs> up and, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, you, you did some white water back then and it was sort of a gong show, but you now have a, a real true passion for doing white water, uh, as you, you proclaim in a bunch of your videos, right? Uh, I yeah, love this. I, I can't I, wait for the next one. I keep thinking about it, right? You want to get into it. What, what, uh, what really drove that? Because for the longest time there, you were doing, you know, flat water or whatever, maybe a bit of river travel here and there. 
but what uh, what pushed you over the edge to to be, have this love for whitewater now? Uh, I think it's always kind of been there. Um, like Rob and I, we used to do countless trips down the Beaver River that flows into Georgian Bay. We would shuttle each other's cars. And when Rob wasn't around, I would drive up to the top end of the Beaver, throw my canoe in, paddle down to Clarksburg, hide my canoe under the bridge, and then I would hitchhike back up to get my car and then come back down. I Sometimes I do it twice in the day, just if I could get a quick ride. But yeah, I'd, I I love the paradox of canoeing, and I was I was talking to someone about this the other day, where flat water you can just you get into a rhythm where you're just paddling along, and you can let your mind wander whether you're like taking in your surroundings and you're watching the birds and you're hearing everything, and your mind it's I I consider it like active meditation where you can you're doing something and you're going somewhere, but your mind is just completely free and clear to think about whatever you want. And then the exact opposite of that to me is the whitewater where you're, you're in this river and you're trying to control the boat and you're picking your line and trying to move back and forth and nothing else matters. Your mind is completely free of any other distraction because you're so focused on, you know, what's the next 10 feet in front of your canoe and then what's 10 feet beyond that. And you, so you're taking in the river just, you know, meters at a time and you know whether you've got emails that are piling up or whether you've you know you, whatever else might be in the back of your mind is just it vanishes yeah. and you just you're purely in that moment right there i love yeah. it it's, and you you took uh did you did you take the course or the the whitewater course at uh paddlers co-op last summer with a bunch of people were you part of that uh, no, big crew I, I went there for the palmer fest weekend and i actually paddled a pack raft um for the first time i thought oh, that'll be fun i'll give that a try and found out very quickly it's impossible to paddle a pack raft without just like a, a ear-to-ear grin on your face it's <laughs> steve so from 46 says that too yeah 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 it's impossible because it's so much fun like they just they spin on a dime they roll over top of everything it's self-failing so you get wet but who cares right you're just bombing through all the rapids and it's so much fun, but most of my white water, um, any skill I've acquired has all just been trial and error. Um, whether it's, you know, learning from my own mistakes or watching videos and, you know, sometimes I have somebody out who's a, a more skilled paddler than I am and I'll get some pointers and little tips and tricks and stuff and what to do. And, but yeah, I've never taken any formal lessons, it's something I mm-hmm. probably should have done a long time ago probably got some pretty ingrained bad habits now but <laughs> yeah, yeah well hey all, all you need to do is get from the top to the bottom right and uh without wrapping the canoe that's the main thing or or dumping it one of the two mm-hmm. i saw was it was it your video that one time i think i commented on it there you you went over and it looked like you tipped over into a big glass of beer that's right yeah that's right okay yeah 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 yeah, yeah. You know, he's all of a sudden, yeah that was seen, that was like, the blood vein last year. And it looked, Look like a, a really nice glass of beer. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the blood vein yet last year, and that was a lot of fun. There was a lot of yeah. good rapids on that river. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So let's uh let's fast forward a little bit now to uh some of these collaborations you've done. Uh as I mentioned, you you know, you've you paddled with Xander Budnick, uh Ben Beauchamp of, of recent. Um how, how how are these collaborations coming coming about? I know we have a good tight knit community of YouTubers. That was evident from all the people that we see at the Toronto Outdoor Adventure Show. Uh, and it, we all kind of gather there and uh, our little after party or, or whatever, but it, it's really cool. The community that we have that you can actually put these collaborations together, right? Yeah, I think it's so cool. And, and this show is a big part of that where you can see just like the chat on the side, people are like, talking to each other. Everybody's familiar with each other, even if they've never even met before there everyone's chatting and yeah the show is like that too where you know like dennis was, or not dennis uh, kevin was saying that you know the, the show's you know someone was commenting that the show would turn into a youtuber love fest and yeah, I, was right, like, yeah, yeah. I was laughing i thought well what's the downside of this right like you've got all these people that like each other they have the similar interests and they're all friends yeah but yeah that's a it's it's all just um you know 
I've watched all these people's videos before, and then it's usually just messaging them and or messaging me messages come my way, and we talk back and forth. And yeah, you know, I I think you could kind of get a sense of some a person's kind of their personality uh, if you watch a, a bunch of their videos and you get a pretty good sense of, yeah, this is somebody that I could probably spend a few days with or, or in some cases, you know, a few weeks, but, um, yeah, it's fun. It adds, I love the solo stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I really enjoy the, the freedom just doing whatever I want, but it's really nice to have somebody else out there who's just as passionate and somebody that, you know, maybe maybe they learn something from me, and I definitely learn something from them every time. Mm -hmm. And then you know, it's hanging around the fire. It's it's. I think canoeing just lends itself to that social aspect, right? There's two seats in most yeah. canoes for a reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the the thing about uh, the socialism with canoeing and having another person there is just being able to share the experience, right? Like mm -hmm. sitting around that campfire at nighttime and having some laughs or, or reminiscing about a moose that you've seen through the day or, you know, mm -hmm. that man, that portage was hard, right? It, it's nice to, uh, to to reflect on these things. I, yeah, I, and I, not I, even I, in the moment. Sorry, yeah. Terry. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, but not even in the moment. Like, it, it's great. Yeah, you're like that you're that night. You can like talk about the day or the day before. And then you find after you. You know, you're you're out there. We've been out here for three days or four days. Like you, it all starts to blend together. But then you also have these memories and these shared experiences that you know you can look back on. You know, years later, like Rob and I will sit around talking about stuff we did 20 years ago, yeah. and you know, talk to to Ben Beauchamp about the Spanish and some of our experiences and just how fun that was last year. And, um. You know, all that kind of stuff. Like, And then when it just keeps happening anyways, like I just keep meeting more. Like I see um, Camp Kitchen here, Tyler um, Scott is in the chat here. And we met at the, the outdoor show. And yeah, he, yeah, just, yeah. He, he came up and introduced himself. We started chatting. And um, we're going to do some collabs this year together. We're going to do some cooking and uh you know, prepping at home for like backcountry meals and freeze drying stuff. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can get it on a canoe trip together as well. But yeah, it just continues to happen as, you know, I think it's the nature of this community anyway, where people are just very welcoming and happy to meet each other. And that leads to paddling together. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, you might be able to, to, to answer this or, or give me, give me an idea of it, but I find Ontario. There's so many canoers in Ontario, right? It, it, I, I'm I, all the YouTubers I follow are Ontario, Ontario paddlers for the most part, right? And it's hard to get outside of this area. I think, which maybe that's the case for all of us YouTubers being able to collaborate and getting to know each other because we're all in that same bubble on in YouTube. Does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? We all kind of follow each other and, and we, we meet each other because like, you know, there, there's only a few hubs that we can go to, to, to meet, and collaborate. And then of course, like, you know, you got like, you know, all the Minnesota, Wisconsin and uh, Michigan paddlers and stuff. I'm not saying that like to, to exclude them, but we have this Ontario type kind of tight knit type of community is, is a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah. I think it's unique in a lot of things. Like I haven't seen a community like this in in backpacking or in other types of camping that's as tight knit and as willing to you know like I, I guess it's make friends and and to build on those friendships I guess you know people mm -hmm. willing to to go out like I, I was on a portage last year I'm walking across it and I realize there's a campsite in the middle of the portage and so I, as I'm walking along, I've got my canoe on my head, and I, hello, is anyone here? And who steps out from behind the tent but Jay and Sherry from Beauty of the Backcountry? Like, <laughs> of, of all the places to meet you on, on a river here, like, people that yeah. you know. And, yeah, it was just ironic. Like, oh, here, here's some friends of ours that we meet in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And sit around, chat for a little bit. Okay, guys, have a good trip, uh, you know. We'll talk to you later and off you go again. And 
Yeah, yeah, I, I've run into that experience myself. Eh? Ontario is such a big province, and that to with so many canoeing opportunities, and to meet meet somebody or run into somebody in a backcountry that you know or they know you, or be, because we we are on YouTube, you know. Uh, give an example: we on our Wabakimi trip last year, two different occasions on the water where people come paddling right up to our site and said, "Hey, is canoe hound up there?" Right. And it's like, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not, you don't expect it. Right. Uh, right at yeah. the Terry Fox Memorial, same thing. Hey, Hey, I follow you. And it's, it's really cool to meet people based on what we kind of do here. Um, you know, yeah. and we're no different than anybody else. We're just, you know, here, I guess. Yeah. I, 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 I've, I've said it to people before. Like I'm, I'm just another jackass with a camera wandering around and like trying to film myself. Like, it's not, I don't take this that seriously. But yeah. like Ben and I got on the, the train last year to go up to Bisco. And before we even loaded up, I hear, hey, is that Tosh? Some guy that, with a bunch of buddies there. I can't remember his name. It escapes me right now. But um, he's talking. He introduces me to everybody. And he's like, oh, Ben's here too. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, he's watched our videos and you know it's, it's kind of neat that they feel you know there's no there's no issue just come on up and say hi like yeah. happy to meet people it's just i'm just another dude right and it's not a big deal at all and then i get to meet all these different people that um like i see people going through the chat here and i was like yep i yeah. you know lose count of how many different people um yeah jeff mccullough yeah we ran into each other in a restaurant uh yeah, I, I and then I see him at the outdoor show, and <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just the the paths keep intersecting. It's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, that that that's the one thing that I, I've gained out of doing this whole this whole canoe hound adventures thing is is the the friendships and the the people that I've met, and it's it's like it's like you know when you you run into somebody like the first time you and I met, eh? It's like we met our. It's like we had met ten times or a hundred times previous because we just kind of have run that same level type of thing, and it's really cool to to be like that with so many different people within this genre, you know, or hiking even for that matter. So, yeah, it's cool mm. stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Richard West is asking a question on how you get your canoe on top of your van. It's a little tricky. So there, there's a roof rack. So right above my head, there's two solar panels. And then from the cab back is basically a big deck. So you can go up the back ladder and sit up there or you could sleep up there if you wanted to. Um, but I prop the canoe up against the back of the van <clears throat> and then go up the ladder and basically just grab an end of it and haul it up over the back. So Sorry, and then reverse coming down. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's a it's a little bit awkward because the van is about nine feet or so high, nine and a bit maybe. Um, so it's a little awkward getting it up and down, but mm -hmm. for now I can manage doing it. Cool. Well, thanks, Richard, for the segue because now we're we're gonna get into talking a little bit about uh, your <laughs> rambling man uh, life that you've been taking on here since the well since the water was supposed to be frozen up here, right? Um, yeah, you you invested yourself into a uh, really cool motorhome and uh, did a little bit of traveling down into uh, the United States for the entire winter. First off, tell tell us what brought that on, and uh, like you know, tell us about the van a little bit. So I've I've always liked the idea of the mobile lifestyle, being able to be in the van and and travel around. Um, not necessarily car camping, but I just like the idea of, like everything I need is in this is in the vehicle with me and I can go wherever I want. I've always liked that. So for a while I, I was looking at vans and considering it and it's a pretty big investment. But then it was just over a year ago that um found out Coop had cancer and then he he passed very quickly. And that was kind of just a moment where I had to sit back and say, like, what am I waiting for? Why am I, you know, just not pulling the trigger on this? And I had looked at this particular van a bunch of times. I had it saved on Kijiji and 
messaged the guy and I said, I'm coming to see it. And he said, when? I said, I can be there in two days. This was in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Um, So jumped on a flight, bought a one-way ticket (laughs) and (laughs) flew to Vancouver. He met me at the airport uh, that morning or in the morning that day. And I spent pretty much most of the day just going through the van, exploring it, seeing how it works, seeing how they would put it all together. And this van checked most of the boxes of everything that I was looking for. So I wanted the the long wheelbase. I really wanted four wheel drive. Uh, I wanted the extra head height so I could stand up in here. And I wanted something mostly built out so I didn't have to spend the whole summer building the van. I could get right into using it. And this one checked most of the boxes. I was pretty happy with it. So yeah, I paid for it and turned around and spent five days driving back from BC back to Ontario. And then in September last year, I moved everything I have into storage and moved into the van full time. Cool. So last last summer, I just kind of bounced around. Pardon me? Yeah. No, I was going to say, very cool, driving it back for five days. You talk about the ultimate shakedown, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I realized pretty quick there were some things I was going to have to do to it um, that needed to change. Uh, so this vehicle is its huge. It's like 20, well, now there's a storage box on the back, so it's probably about 24 feet long. It's a one-ton dually van that weighs in at about 10,000 pounds. So, and that has a three liter diesel engine, which didn't give a a whole lot of power. And the gas tank was really small. This, I think the gas tank was 24 and a half gallons, um, which is what, like 85 liters or something like that. Yeah. So, so I was stopping way too often to get gas <laughs> just because it was so small. But like I said, it, it checked most of the boxes and yeah, I've never regretted once buying it. Like I've, I've said to several people, like every time I, I see this thing park somewhere, it just puts a smile on my face. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I actually, just, I love the van itself and, um, it took a little bit to get used to just having the van and having everything in storage and the idea of, you know, like I'm parked on the street here right now and we're connected to the internet through my phone. And, um, so there's, there's little things that took some time to getting used to and, you know, hear people walk by on the street all the time or, you know, it's, it's a little bit odd, but I've totally fallen in love with the whole lifestyle of this. It's, it's great. It's a it's a real simplistic lifestyle, right? Like you you only have so much room to store stuff and, and and keep your belongings. So you're you're obviously a minimalist when it comes to these types of things. You know, uh, seen some of your videos. You know, you're going in to shower, obviously in the in the gym, and and you know doing whatever else you need to do at the gym, and then you know you're shopping, your small grocery lists, things like that. Is that, mm-hmm. was that anything, was that tough to get used to that whole minimalist uh, type of thing? Um, yeah, because I'm, I like kit, I like gear, I like equipment. So when I was in the army, I had lots of, you know, gear and I was always looking for something better. And I'm the same thing when it comes to camping gear. I'm like, Ooh, is that better? Is that more efficient? And you can only buy so much because I mean, you're going to end up sleeping on it in here if you're not careful. Right. So, yeah, it's 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 a little bit different. Just, but I found, you know, now that I'm back in Ontario, I went back to my storage unit, and the first thing I did was start going through bins, going like, okay, I don't need this stuff, I don't need this, I, and I made a huge, I made a run to the dump, and then I made a run to donate like a garbage bag full of clothes, and I still have way too many clothes in here um, that I'll probably ever need, but. It's it's kind of neat to realize how little you actually need. You know, when you go on a canoe trip, it's the same thing. Like you've got what you've got in your packs, and and if you don't have it, well, you're gonna make do without it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember seeing yes. this comedian one time. He he kept talking about stuff. Yeah. I don't know if you ever heard the routine. 
uh, stuff is like, you know, you just go out and you buy stuff and your house is just a place to keep stuff. Right. And that's mm -hmm. so true. Right. Like, you know, you're, here you are living out of a van yet. I got this house here and I got more crap in this place uh, than, than I, you can shake a stick at. Right. You talk about camping gear. If I, if I had your, if I had your camper there, I'd have to pull a trailer behind me probably to keep <laughs> my stuff in. Right. So, yeah. And, and I see people, I, I met people just on this, on travels that, uh, I met one girl who was living in a, in a Prius and she had laid the back seat down. And so on, on one side she would sleep. And then she had these little bins with like pull out drawers for her clothes on the other side of the seat. And uh, yeah, George Carlin. Um, and then she had removed the passenger seat of the car and built a little table in. And she had a little stove and that was it. Like she would cook outside when it was nice out. And if it was inclement, she just like cracked the windows open and whatever. But she said she'd been living in her car for two years and she just loved the simplicity of it. She's like, it's mm -hmm. inconspicuous. No one's ever going to know I'm in here. You know, the windows were blacked out and whatever in the back. And she said, yeah, I go wherever I want you know, live cheap and allows me to travel. It's like, well, yeah, why not? Yeah. If yeah. you can make that work. If you, if you could shuck all the, any commitments that you think you have, right. Or that you may have, um, mm -hmm. I, I would think that was probably, would probably be the, the toughest part. If, if I were ever, I, I don't think I could do what you're doing uh, because I married grandkids, the whole nine yards. Right. But, uh, shucking the things that you think are holding you down, I think would be the biggest obstacle. Is it, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, what I found was it's, it's little things that I never thought about that are part of your, you know, maybe your daily, weekly, monthly routines. Um, like you probably go to the same barbershop mm -hmm. or wherever you get your haircut. You, you probably go to the same place regularly. And they know your name and you're, they're familiar. You know, you sit down, they're like, oh, same as always. And they just, they, they know how to cut your hair. They know how you want it. Um, same with your grocery store. You know where one is. You, you make the same three turns to get to the grocery store every time. And you can go in and you know where everything is, right? You, you're just, you're familiar with it. And even the cashiers might know you after a while. And all of that was was different like every time I'm in a new town or something, it's like, okay, what grocery store is available? And so I'm scrolling through my phone going, yeah, I, you know, I, I fell in love with actually sprouts, the grocery store. It's a pretty neat little store, but you got to find one everywhere you go. And, you know, sometimes I, you know, I'm in Phoenix and it's a city of 7 million people and okay, where's the nearest grocery store? Okay. I need to go get uh, whatever it is, something, you know, cleaning supplies or something. Yeah. Okay. I'll get that there. And uh, I should go to Walmart and pick that up. Okay. Where's the near, you just don't know where anything is. Right. But there's a, it's kind of fun at the same time, trying to figure it out every time you go somewhere and, and what's the best way to get there. You know, should I park the van and, you know, jump on the, the sky rail train and go into town or, or should I, you know, try and drive through the city and yeah, I don't know. It was, every day just be, kind of became like just a mini adventure. Right. When, when I was putting this, this show together, I, I was trying to think of the concept, whether, you know, do, do we do a show on overlanding? And I started thinking, well, you're not really doing overlanding. You're, you're like traveling the U S right. It's not like the, the old overlanding type of crew. Although you do do a little overlanding to, to get to some <laughs> of the places that you're, you're, you're venture seeking in. Right. Yep. So, I, I decided, no, we're just going to talk about this and, and see, because it's really cool. It, like you're on the ultimate road trip, right? Uh, wh when did you start and how did you plan your destinations? So I left Ontario, I think it was the 24th or 5th of November. Um, right. Stopped to see a few friends on the way down south and... Um, the only real destination I had in mind was um, to stop in to Iowa to see Ray Fletcher. He makes these custom longbows. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we had been talking and he, he made me a bow. So 
I had to stop in and pick that up. And so I drove across through, you know, Michigan, I guess it's Indiana, Illinois, and then Iowa. I don't know. I can't remember anyways. Got into Iowa. I stopped at his place overnight. And then I remember saying to him, all right, I'm getting on the highway and I'm going south till I can put some shorts on. And then it was just down through the Midwest and into Texas. And I really had no set plan of anywhere I had to be. It was more about just go and explore. And if, if the area turns out to be a really cool area to explore, I'll stay there longer. And if I feel like I want to move on, it's just, you know, if I, if I don't like the neighbors or the view, then I can just turn the key and drive away. Yeah. It's it kind of nice to have that freedom just to, to do what you want. Or, hey, I don't even want to travel today because I got a really mm-hmm. killer, killer spot here and I just want to sit here and take it in for another day or two, right? Yeah. I I think it was like if you've ever done like an extended crown land camping trip where there's you, you can just go left or right or you know go any which way any direction on the compass that you feel like and go explore that's pretty much what it's been like oh do I take this road or that road or go here or go there it's well I like to see that spot you know uh, okay mm-hmm. well I'll work my way you know I wanted to go down and spend some time in Big Bend and um, so I went down to Big Bend National Park and I ended up spending 10 or 12 days down there and swimming in the Rio Grande. There's a hot spring right down there. And I did some hiking through the deserts. And that was the first time I saw, I think they were wild horses. They may not have been, but I'm pretty sure they were. And then wild burrows as well. There's wild burrows all across. Like It's like driving along in Algonquin. You see a moose. Well, down there, it's donkeys. Really, eh? Yeah. That's something you wouldn't really think of. Yeah, wild horses and the wild donkeys. Yeah, because you don't think of yeah. those animals being wild. Eh? You always think of them being in captivity. Ever see a wild yeah, cow? Right. <laughs> uh, I saw free-range cattle that looked pretty wild. Yeah. But a lot of the Southwest, they, they, they do the opposite we do here. So when, when you have livestock here, you fence to keep it in an area. And there they tend to fence to keep animals out. So there's cattle grates at a lot of the road crossings and then there'll be a fence along it. And beyond that, there'll just be a sign that says free range cattle. And you'll just, you're driving along. It's desert. You can see for miles and it's like, Oh, there's some cows over there. And uh, there's something over there. I don't even know what that is, but everything is just roaming around. Wow. That's the, 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 you know, it's hard to fathom that here in, in in our populated area, right? That there there's that much room down there that they could just eh, let the cows go, <laughs> you know, yeah. put a tag on and, them, maybe find them later. Yeah, and some of those Texas ranches are just massive. That's the the one drawback I found with Texas is that there's very little public land. Yeah. There's it's most of Texas is privately owned, and you're talking about some ranches that are like a million acres or more and wow. it's just it's absurd how big some of these places are you're driving along and it's like you've been driving for a while and you're like oh, it's the same sign on the side of the road on the fence post like it's still it's the circle k ranch or whatever it is right yeah yeah well Ye- yellowstone all over again right yeah but yeah so I, I went down through texas and i spent some time there um Again, just I, I didn't film a lot, and I think it's it's hard for me to say why I didn't. Part of it was the the permitting system, and it's hard to film in national parks. You need to get permits, and it's kind of a pain. But part of it was I I think I just wanted to just explore and just have some freedom and kind of relax a little bit and not feel the pressure of. I guess I think it's pressure I just put on myself of like I need to be making another video, but. Um, yeah, I just, the freedom of the road, just, I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. Got so used to like, just stop wherever you want and and I can crawl on the back and, and in big bend, um, I would crawl on the back and sleep 
and I, yeah, I had to have a designated campsite, but really the campsite is, is like a stake in the ground at a patch of dirt in the desert. Like there's enough room to park at and then there's nothing around for miles, but I was a hundred feet from the Rio Grande river and, um, a couple miles from a hot spring. So I get up in the morning and go to the hot spring and like watch the sun come up soaking in the hot spring and then roll out of that into the Rio Grande and into the cooler water. And then I just go back and forth three or four times every morning and, mm -hmm. um, swam across to Mexico a bunch of times or like just swam out in the river, you know, touch the, Oh, there's Mexico, touch the shoreline and you know, swim back. Oh, cool. Yeah. But you, you can walk across the river. It's, it's knee deep in most places. Yeah. So with, with, with this many year, uh, this freedom that, uh, that you kind of had there over, over that period of time, how many of these adventures came out of maybe, you know, going into a diner or something and just striking up a conversation with somebody and they go, yeah, that like the, the guy who told you, yeah, I go out there, I find arrowheads all the time. Right. Uh, yeah. did, you, did you run into that very often where you just get shooting the breeze with somebody else that might be a van dweller like yourself or uh, in a restaurant or at the gym? Yeah, the, the part that probably that's exactly what blew me away probably as much as anything down there, like the scenery is spectacular, I mean, but it was the people. Yeah. And I saw this really big paradox. So I would go into the gym, I was going into Planet Fitness, and I started getting back into the gym pretty regularly. So doing a bit of a workout and shower or whatever. And when you're in the gym, there's all these TVs. And... So there's, you know, CS, uh, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, all across. And if you stood there in the gym and watched the TV, you'd think the whole world was on fire. You'd think yeah. everybody was fighting with everybody. And then I go outside and it's just everybody was so polite and so friendly and so courteous. Like I was absolutely blown away with just how nice people were um you know you walk into the grocery store and three people would turn at the door welcome in and that's a very common southern or southwest greeting and um everywhere i went it's just people were just friendly if whether it was like a campground somewhere or just in a, a store i'd go in and check out rei or something and people oh where are you from where are you going oh you know what you should check out everybody seems so willing to just drop little hints and tips of, Oh, oh if you're going to go there, go around this way. And, 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 you know, this is the touristy side, but go around the backside and like nobody yeah. goes over there. And it's that local Intel that was amazing, but it was, it was just the, the, the courtesy and the, the friendliness of all the people I met. Like it was amazing. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool because, yeah, you know, what better way to, to find out about the area than to talk to the locals, right? Just like we do yeah. when we go up north, you know, you talk to somebody up there. It could be an outfitter. It could be the place, that the, you know, the guy at the bait store or, you know, whoever. And, uh, yeah, get information like that just to uh, to accentuate and highlight the mm -hmm. trip, right? Because yeah. they know. Yeah. That's cool. Um. I just saw there's a question there. How does it work drinking alcohol in the van? I don't know. Um, this is iced tea. And uh, I don't drink in the van, so I really don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah that's one thing I, I changed. I don't drink when I'm on my own at all. So just a personal preference. But I'd imagine just if you, if you did, it would be probably just only when you're parked. Uh, or I think or... so. It's, it's it depends. I know state to state was a little different. Some of the rules were changing, so I don't know. I got I got I didn't have to worry about it because I wasn't drinking in the van, and I was like, okay, that's problem solved. I don't have to. I don't have to worry <laughs> right. about it. <laughs> yeah, but you did bring on a, a newfound addiction to this particular iced tea, as you keep oh, saying. Liquid it's... liquid death is is this deadly Hold that iced up. tea. Cool, kid. <laughs> yeah. Liquid death. What are yeah. they to call <laughs> an iced tea uh, drink? Man. Yeah, it's just a non-carbonated iced tea, and it is so good. Wow, that's cool. Well, Tosh, let's uh, let's take our commercial break now, and then I want to get back into uh, talking a more a little bit more about the van life. We'll uh, field a bunch more questions and 
maybe I'll throw the link in. And if anybody wants to come up and ask a question about your adventures here over the last several months, uh, we could bring them on as well. So uh, we'll see you in just a short moment here. Okay, sounds good. All righty, if I can find the right button. Here it is. There's nothing like being out there. For over 50 years, we've been connecting people with nature by building classic Canadian canoe designs using the best materials available. We built a reputation on durable, dependable canoes that allow you to focus on what's important, whether that's unplugging in remote wilderness, spending quality time with your favorite people, or nailing the perfect line. Visit novacraft.com to find the perfect canoe for you and locate your nearest authorized dealer. Tonight's episode of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show is brought to you by Kit Products, Stick Stoves and Reflector Ovens proudly made in Canada. Algonquin Outfitters, with five key locations in and around Algonquin Park to serve your backcountry needs. Salus Marine, keeping you safe on the water since 1999. Ostrom Outdoors, custom fit canoe packs and barrel harnesses. Badger Paddles, handcrafted canoe paddles made to order. And Novacraft Canoes, connecting you with nature in Canadian-made canoes since 1970. Hey, and welcome back to the second half of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. Uh, I see uh, we got your dad in the uh, the, the chat here, Tosh. Uh, let's bring Tosh back up from uh, the YouTube channel, Tosh Self-Propelled. Uh, we're just chatting tonight about, uh, we were chatting about some of his canoe adventuring and stuff like that. Now we're on to uh, the the most recent part of his life where he's been traveling the U.S. and he's now back in Ontario uh, getting ready to come back and do some more canoeing. So, man, uh, Oliver Tosh, he says, that's my son, proud of him. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> uh, so, man, you uh, while you're on the road, uh, you must have had a lot of uh, great encounters. Um, down there you mentioned uh you met the one young lady who was sort of living in her prius which i can't i couldn't imagine that she must have been a tiny little thing if you yeah she was pretty short <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was it like being on the road like that did you uh did you come across or did you happen to maybe follow any other uh people that might be living the van life like yourself was there any connections down there I ran into a few people that I recognized from Instagram or YouTube or something, and there was a few times we had brief conversations, but it's it's one distinct difference between that crowd and like this this paddling community here is they're they're much more separated. Like there's there's not as much collaboration. There isn't as much, um, you know, people are just it's more individual, I guess. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, there wasn't too many, like I didn't really camp with anybody else I didn't, that I knew or anything. Like most of the time I was just, I was on my own pretty much all the time and uh, finding campsites and traveling around. And there were places where I ran into, there was other people there at, especially at, you know, hot springs or on popular hiking trails or whatever. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I think there's a very unique thing in this paddling community, um, especially around Ontario, where the, the people are very quick to become friends. And, and yeah, much, I, I, I watch. I, I I've been watching. Like you know, we could watch all we want of like canoeing and backpacking and backcountry camping and stuff, but you got to watch other stuff on YouTube or or other <laughs> you know other sources as well, and. <laughs> I have in the past watched, you know, these people who live the van lives and they, they travel or, or not even travel. And I find it's, it's two different crowds. It's people like yourself who choose to do it. And then there's those out of necessity. That's all they have is, is that lifestyle. Right. But they seem to be more focused and centered around like a particular area or a particular city. Whereas you you seem to be traveling and you're doing it because this is the lifestyle you want to, to, to leave. Mm -hmm. right? big difference when it comes to that right did you meet both 
types of people down there? Yeah, definitely. There was, I met a lot of people that were traveling all over the place. And then you just get people who are, you know, living in vehicles out of more necessity, right? They still have jobs mm -hmm. to go to and they're living in a community, but they, they you know, choose to live cheaper. And um, I noticed that particularly around um, actually Las Vegas. Las Vegas was, first of all, like blew my mind because you think of like the lights and the Las Vegas strip and everything. But yeah. that's such yeah. a that's such a small area. Yeah. And then you get 30 to 50 kilometers outside of Las Vegas and you're in the middle of absolute nowhere. There's, right. there's nothing. There's no noise. Like some of the most beautiful sunsets I've ever seen happen, you know, within 50K of Vegas. And you're out in the middle of the desert. You wouldn't like someone could have dropped you on another planet. You'd never know there was a city of a couple million people just over there. Mm -hmm. And I met quite a few people there because I spent a fair bit of time around like the Lake Mead area. Um, <laughs> and so I would come in and I, for, for a little bit, I would go into the same gym and I started to recognize a few of the vehicles that were, um, they call it dispersed camping down there. Mm -hmm. They'll have they'll have an area of desert that's designated as dispersed camping, and you can just drive into it. And oftentimes, there's semi-designated by fire pits. There's little campsites around, but you might see 50 campers, and everybody's 100 to 200 meters apart, and they're all just they've got their little spot. And then some people get up in the morning and they drive into work, and then they come back out, and they might get the same spot, or they might have to park in a different spot and then they do the next thing. And so I would see these people oftentimes at the gym and yeah, you'd get, you'd chat a little bit and, Oh yeah, I live in my truck or I live in my, you know, they have a camper, a slide in camper or, and, and it's to live cheaper or maybe out of necessity because rent was too expensive or whatever it was. But mm -hmm. yeah, they, um, a lot of interesting characters. That's, yeah, but your your style is more. This is RV. You're kind of RVing, right? It's a recreational vehicle, and you're yeah, you're you're getting to see the sights and the sounds of uh, all the areas that you're traveling to. That's uh, yeah. that's really cool. Are for the most part places that you're you're camping or you're staying for the night? Are you for the most part in these areas that are are free camping, or are you paying to camp at many locations, or how does that work? Um, most of what I sp stayed in was free. I very rarely had to pay to camp anywhere. Um, Texas was a spot that I had to pay most often, um, because there just isn't a whole lot of, um, public land. And then like Arizona and Nevada, Utah, I didn't pay for anything. Um, I think I paid for one night or two night two nights in Arizona at a campground because I wanted to have the van plugged into shore power so that I was editing a video and I thought, okay, this, this is going to take some extra power and a little bit longer. I'm going to have my computer running for longer, and so I, pl I just you know it was thirty five bucks or something a night, and I was able to plug in. But then after that, I realized like, oh, I can just go to the public library and. Um, and that was another experience with how friendly these people are. I went into a public library one day and the, there was a lady there in a security uniform and she came over. I had headphones on and I'm editing away on my laptop and she taps me on the shoulder and I turn and I thought, oh, first thought was she's going to tell me to leave. I'm not a, a member here. I'm not from the community. I don't have a library card or whatever it was. And she taps me on the shoulder and she says, I just want you to know that, uh, you know, we have some private rooms in the back um, that are soundproof. So if you want to go do your work back there to not be disturbed, she said, I know there's some kids running around. And, you know, I, I like that the kids are here and they're reading and they're doing their program. And so I don't want to, you know, discourage them. But if they're bothering you, we have private rooms you could go use oh, wow. just to let you oh, know. And she's like, okay, well, have a nice day, sweetheart. And, you know, like, just, <laughs> I'm like oh, thank you very much. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, nobody was bothering me, but it's just, they, it seemed like they went like that extra step to be extra friendly to you. Yeah. It was, the, the, the Southern uh, hospitality, right? 
it, it's a real thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, we got somebody in the basement here. We'll bring him up there. Uh, probably somebody else you're very familiar with. We got Tim from Super Good Camp. And how you doing there, Tim? Hey. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you? Good, good. Good evening, sir. Uh, Question for our guest tonight. Yeah, so it's it's the it, perfect segue. It's the cost thing. How does like it, you must pay a ridiculous amount of money for fuel? How how much how much do you fork out for fuel? And and how do you I don't know how do you how do you play that angle? How does how does it work for? How, how do you pay for it? He, he's making yeah. a million dollars on YouTube, Tim. Come on. We all do. Yeah. Us YouTubers are all yeah. millionaires. If I was relying on YouTube to make money, I would have starved to death a long time. Sorry, I was trying to think of a nice way to say, how are you not making money on YouTube, but still having to pay for that fuel? Yeah. yeah. So the when I left the military, I was medically released. And so I have a pension that I got from the military that I live on now. And... I try to stay well underneath of that pension, but yeah, ga gas was by far my biggest expense this whole trip. Um, just putting fuel in the van. So yeah, I weighed a lot of the trips thinking like, how far do I want to drive? How far is that place? All right, though, that's a thousand kilometers away. All right, that, how much is that going to cost me? And based on that, that was a big calculation, like to somewhere, but then other places, like I, I got to go to the Grand Canyon. I just have to go. So I got to make that work. Like that's just a, not an option, but yeah, it's, it's just a constant balancing of, you know, uh, I, the van, I don't have any payments on the van. I was able to buy it outright. And so my, my day-to-day -day expenses are pretty low. I don't have any other rent anywhere. Um, so I, I basically have my storage unit, my phone, uh, my insurance. I think that's really my only fixed expenses other than say, oh, like that, a, that, what about that hearty appetite of yours? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's gotta be yeah. built in there, but I yeah, would yeah. have that regardless of where I was living is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's just, a it's part of the rent, I guess. Um, that's how I kind of look at it. So that's living expenses. Okay, cool. So, so it, it, you, sometimes you stay a little closer, but then you take that trip to the Grand Canyon because that has to happen. Not an option. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. And the same thing with trying to find free camping sites. Like I, I could have stayed every night at the KOA or something like that and been able to plug in and, and have unlimited power, but rather than do that, I'll manage my power. Um, you know, make sure that I'm, I'm, if I'm making enough solar, then I can run everything in here and I don't have to drive as much. Um, I have a little solar panel that I would prop up in the front window and plug a battery pack into. And that way I didn't have to use my main batteries to charge my phone at night or anything like that. So it just makes my batteries last a little longer. It means I don't have to drive quite as much. And, you know, thankfully down there, there's plenty of sun. So I was making plenty of uh, power but all those little things that just you know little grains on the scale of considering what to do and um yeah it's little stuff sweet and uh just out of curiosity as well you're uh uh because you're broadcasting right like you're you're using your phone uh data how does that does it play across the borders? Do you have a, like a, a, a North America package? Yeah. I, again, just for the people that might be interested in doing van life stuff, right? Yeah. Not, so not I me. have a, yeah, I have a, a North American plan on my phone. So I've got unlimited data, Canada, US, Mexico. Um, I think it's 150 gigs or something at high speed and then it goes, but I, I've never gone anywhere near that. Mm -hmm. And I think I pay a hundred bucks a month or something for that, which it is what it is. It's the best plan I could find for being able to travel. And initially I did um, have Starlink in the van and 
two reasons. I one, it's expensive. The monthly fees are expensive. Just the Starlink itself is two hundred bucks a month, and and then it it draws a lot of power, and so I was limited in even how much I was going to use it. So before I even went south, I realized I've got all this data on my phone. I can either use my phone or, or tether that to the hotspot for the for my computer and do what I need to do for the most part. And so I just left the Starlink here. Um, I don't even know if I'm going to use it. I may put it up for sale now. I, it's just not cost effective for me at this point. There you go. Cool. Here's your chance to advertise it for sale, Tosh. Somebody in the yeah. chat will want to be. <laughs> yeah. I haven't decided it yet, but I, I'm leaning that way. Yeah. How, how often were you out of cell range while you were uh, traveling? Was there a lot of opportunities? Or Because you looked like you were camping at some very remote very spots remote spot for the most part. Yeah, th I was amazed at the, the cell reception in the U.S. And I guess because I have a Canadian plan, I'm not limited to which carrier I can use in the States. Like, they'll just use whatever carrier is available. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I would be on AT&T. Sometimes I would be on Verizon. Um and other people might not have service in that spot because they were locked in, I think, with just one of those carriers. But because okay. of okay. the international plan, I could bounce off anything. And I found it surprisingly good. Um, very rarely was I out of, like, completely out of cell coverage unless I got pretty remote. And then, of course, you'd expect to be. But for the most part, it was pretty good coverage. Mm-hmm. I, I got a question for you, and this is uh, it, because you're in the military. How, how much of a role does that play with this lifestyle that you that you've got? Because in the videos I've seen, I don't know if you do a lot of housekeeping when before you do a shot or whatever it is, but you seem very organized with the way you have things in your van, with the way you pack your backpack. Uh, the bed looks like it's you know to military issue the way. <laughs> Not the corners are tucked and everything like that. The, the, does a lot of that have to play with your background in, in, in the military? Uh, I think part of it is personality and part of it is um, military habits. Mm -hmm. I've always been pretty organized. But, yeah, the military will beat that into you whether you want to be or not. Right. Um, so I got so used to trying to always. Like, that's one thing, especially in the infantry, is you're always trying to get more efficient. Um, you know, if you got your rucksack, your backpack packed, you're not going to be able to turn on a headlight to go in and search for something. So you have to know, you know, oh, oh my spare socks are at the very bottom down the right hand side of the pack because you have to be able to find them in the dark. And you might only have a few minutes to change your socks. So you change your socks tactically, which is take one boot off, take one sock off, put that sock and then boot back on and then go to the other foot. And all of that stuff just became such a habit to me that now when I pack a backpack or I pack my canoe, I'm, I'm just conscious about, you know, the things I'm going to want the most going on top and the things I need the least going in first. And same thing in the van. When I pack stuff, I, you know, I could come in here in the dark and I know where I can reach to get different things. I know this cupboard always sticks, so I need to push on it here and it pops open and, I, I, part of the military, but yeah, definitely partly my uh, my personality too. Right, right. Cool, Tim. You got any other questions for uh, for talking? No, I think I think that's great. Like we, I think that plays well into not van life. Well, plays well into van life. Plays well into backcountry where you're in a canoe and you and it's like you get to the campsite and the sun's going down. And it's like ah crap, crap, crap. I don't even know where my headlamp is. No, you need to know exactly where all the things are so that you can mm -hmm. get it set up and make yourself, you know, in, into your evening without it being a, a nightmare. Yeah, cool. Just, I, I find things more enjoyable when it's efficient and I don't have to fight. Like it, it honestly just annoys me when I can't find something. And, and so if I can't remember where I put it, I get annoyed. But yeah, if you can just find it, everything just goes so much faster and yeah. easier. 
I have True. kids. I, I just blame them. It's not a problem. <laughs> Pam, where's that? Where's that? <laughs> Play the same thing I do all the time. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate you popping up. Uh, you knew you know the routine after the show, right? See, si, senor. Uh, okay, right. Talk to you you. Have a good one, kids. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's uh, that's cool. You know, more people need to take a page out of your book than uh, and uh, you know figure out how to to be more organized because that could even come into play in the backcountry when you're paddling. You know, I, I I try to keep everything together, but it doesn't always stay together. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Tell tell us about the van. Uh, g- give us some details on it because you, you mentioned it's a a, a long box sprinter uh, dually with a three liter engine. Well, what what type of features do you have built into that thing? So, um, yeah, so this is the Dually 3500. So it's it's a one ton frame, and I mentioned before about changing the gas tank out. That was one of the first things I did. I went from a 24 and a half gallon tank to a 47 gallon tank now. So that drastically inc- increased the range of the van and the frequency and needing to stop um and then i had i I wanted to get a a bunch of stuff done while i was down in the u.s because you just the the resources just aren't here in canada so i had that done um i had the there's a little it's called a handheld tuner it plugs into the computer of the van and it allows you through an app on your phone to like customize how the engine operates mm-hmm. and tune the engine a little bit, but it also gives an extra, I think it's 69 horsepower and 110 foot pounds of torque to the engine just by adjusting how the turbo on the diesel engine kicks in. And this thing handles so much better. Like I was on some of those highways going down south, you know, I'd be going up a big hill and I'm getting passed by transport trucks because I'm just, chugging up the hills and and the speed limits are way higher in the states like a lot of the highways when you get down south are 80 miles an hour which is almost 130 yeah um but i'm not cruising along at that speed but i can uh, i'm not impeding the flow of traffic anymore like i initially was um yeah so it's got the van has a built-in diesel furnace um and included with that is a diesel hot water heater so that draws straight out of the fuel tank um and yeah so on the back door uh, i've got a shower because i've got 180 liters of water uh, built into two tanks over the rear wheel wells so if i'm out in the stick somewhere then i can have a shower on the back door and um, yeah, it's pretty easy, pretty slick with hot water on demand. Mm-hmm. Only takes a, bit, a minute or so for the water to actually get up to temperature. And, um, yeah, what else is there? Uh, onboard fridge, I've got 400 watts of solar on the roof and 400 amp hours of battery life in here. So I can charge that solar or while I'm driving or plugged into shore power my batteries will charge and most of what's in here runs on 12 volt so all the lights the fridge and everything runs on 12 which draws a lot less power and then i have a bunch of outlets that i can switch the inverter over and and do 120 mm-hmm. and like now my computer's plugged into that and so it that eats do up you, the power a little faster but are you able your electricity is it is it able to keep up with your demand like through solar? For the most part, yeah. I, I never had really any issues where I couldn't do anything that I needed to. Um, there are some changes I'd like to do. Like I have hot plates that I, have to, I take out of a cupboard and I sit on the counter and plug into the electric. And I, I would like to have a built-in cooktop um, just to make it you know, a little simpler, less moving parts and whatever. But mm-hmm. yeah, I never had really any issue with not having enough power um the solar is pretty efficient as long as i keep the panels clean you know every few days go up and just wipe them down knock the dust off it makes a big difference when they're yep. cleaned off but yeah between all the driving and and the solar 
yeah, I didn't have any problem keeping up. Cool. Cool. And now let's talk a little bit about some of the sites that you've seen. Uh, you, you've been, you've mentioned a Rio Grande and, uh, you know, Vegas. What, what are some of the more spectacular things that you've actually come across and, and maybe things that you've experienced that were like unexpected? Uh, one of the unexpected ones was a video I just put out recently, actually, um, in Utah. And it's got a few different names. Some people call it the moonscape, um, but um, some people refer to it as a Caneville Badlands. And it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Um, left the pavement and drove for about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 kilometers on just rutted up gravel roads until that finally turned into just a two track trail. And there's literally nothing growing. It's just dirt and rock. And you go out to this point and it's a peninsula. You can drive right out to the end of it. And you're four to 500 feet at the edge of this cliff. And when you walk up to the edge of it, you can see I don't know how many miles, probably 20, uh, wow. probably further. And you're looking due east. So in the morning, the sun comes up like right into your face over this. And it, it's just, it looks like the moon. That's the only way to describe it. It's just gray rock as far as you can see. And then at some point, for whatever reason, there's a clear distinction, a line, and the rock turns red. And it's like uh, the going to the Grand Canyon was pretty cool just because of how big it is but this place was unique just by how unexpected it was right and and that was again word of mouth i went to a hot spring in utah and the guy one of the guys sitting next to me is like oh you know where you need to go you gotta go here if you're in utah because i was talking about obviously like trying to film and everything and he said oh it's, it's blm land go out you can film you can fly your drone you can do whatever you want and yeah i went out and camped the night and I was the only one there for three or four hours and then kind of cr maybe six or eight vehicles show up right at dusk to see the sun go down. And then everybody left. I had the place to myself for the night. And then before sunrise the next morning, people start coming in again to see the sun come up. Cool. And yeah, it's so there's other people around. It's not, you know, you're not in the middle of nowhere. You can drive to it. But yeah, it was really cool. It's such a unique, different atmosphere. So some of the some of the drone footage you had in that one there was pretty spectacular. Like that was uh, that was awesome, awesome location. Yeah, yeah, it was neat. Ever ever any uh, any instances of uh, concern where you know maybe you didn't feel safe or you know, I've I've had a few people ask me that and. I honestly can't think of a single time where I was like, oh, I, I shouldn't be here right now or I, I need to get out of here. You know, there's a few times I woke up in the night and I'm like, oh, it was that noise and look out the back window and like, you know, if I was parked somewhere where I was more obvious, I followed two rules basically in looking for parking. If I had to be parked in a more built up area where there's people around, I parked in an obvious spot that I tried to find somewhere like well lit so that there's, you know, there's just ambient light around the van at night. And then yeah. when I would get off the paved roads and into the dirt, I would try and find the most remote corner I could where, you know, if there was anybody within eyesight, I tried to find somewhere else where I could even tuck into a little slot Canyon or something where nobody mm -hmm. was around, but, yeah, not once did I ever wake up in the night or like go to bed thinking, you know, this is kind of a sketchy place or anything like that. Yeah. A, a lot of people warn me about different places and I don't know, maybe I was ignorant to it, but I didn't yeah. feel like threatened or nervous at all. <laughs> did any of those camping spots include like Cracker Barrel or uh, Walmart parking lots? There was a few, especially on the way down. Uh, a few Walmarts on the way down, and then in Texas, there were a few parking lots. Um, once I got out of Texas and into Arizona, it was pretty much all just find a spot in the desert. Right. And so yeah. I should actually show you this. There's, this, this is a pretty cool app. Um, 
it's called I Overlander. So it looks like like that little guy there, uh, which that one there. So you go and it's it's everywhere. It's all across North America. So all of those are listed campsites, and okay. they're all unofficial campsites, really. But you can scroll all across Ontario and Quebec. There's hundreds of thousands of campsites all across North America on this app. And it's all crowdsourced. It's all made by people who are using it. And you can customize the filters. You can put it in for established campgrounds. Um, you can look for fuel or food or whatever it is. There's about 30 things on the on the list you can look for. And I would use that to find spots all the time. Just scroll up and down looking and, and you can tap on the spot. It'll give you a little description. If more than one person has stayed there, you can add to the description with your experience. And then oftentimes there's some pictures as well. Mm -hmm. And what's the name of that app again? I Overlander. I Overlander. Yeah, I it's no um, yeah, it's it's fantastic. I used it almost exclusively once I got out of Texas. Mm -hmm. To I, I think I used it a couple times in Texas, but it's pretty limited there with the lack of um, public land, but. All through Arizona, um, Nevada, Utah, uh, Colorado, like everywhere. Cool. I tried to stay out of California because the gas was so expensive there. But uh, yeah, it's you can use it anywhere. It's all over the place. Yeah, you, you mentioned now, now that you're back in Ottawa there, you said that it's kind of a shocker when you got home and seen gas prices around here compared to what mm -hmm. you were paying in the U.S., eh? Yeah, it was uh, about a buck a liter in the U.S. for the most part, and maybe it, what's that a buck twenty five or something with their currency exchange? Yeah, it's still a lot cheaper. Wow, that's crazy. I'm gonna field a few questions from uh, from the chat here. I'm just gonna work my way backwards here. Uh, Martin Kernstein's asking, not saying you broke any laws. Did you have any experiences with enforcement being from Canada? No, not at all, actually. I, I thought that might happen, um, that people would see a, a non-U.S. license plate and maybe give me a hard time or something. But no, I people were friendly. Um, I stopped. I talked to state troopers a couple times. I was I got some tips from state troopers on spots to camp. Um, they saw me cooking one day in a parking lot. There was two of them and I had the door open and I was cooking on the counter right here with a sliding door open. And, uh, they asked me if I was camping there in that parking lot. I said, no, but I'm going to probably find a place local. And they were able to point me. They said, yeah, it's out of town that way and you'll be fine. So hmm. yeah, I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't have a single time. People always dread, you know, you get into bed at night and someone knocks on the door and tells you that you're not allowed to camp there and you have to move. But man, it hasn't happened to me once, actually. Cool. That's cool. Uh, here, here's a nice trivial question from Evan asking, where's the best tasting tap water you had? <laughs> <laughs> best tasting tap water. Oh. I don't know supposed to say right in your van <laughs> i i guess so uh i think the tap water so i have a, a five gallon jug that feeds a little tap uh for drinking water just so you can take that jug out and clean it easier than the big tanks and i think right now i still have utah water in that jug right now it tastes pretty good yeah did you re rely on bottled water and stuff like that uh, no, or, I could find spots to fill up that five gallon and I would mix, use that to drink and, you know, give it a rinse out every time I refilled it. So, um, drank a lot of liquid death iced tea, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Uh, Richard asks, uh, ever get stuck in a van in the middle of nowhere? Four wheel drive always worked for you? The four wheel drive always worked. I came very close once, um, right at the Arizona Nevada border. 
um, I decided to go into this area where people said, if you go there, there's a bunch of wild burrows that, um, that you can, they're, they're pretty, um, habituated to people. So I went in and it became like a real goat trail getting in and there were burrows there. It was pretty cool, but getting back, it was pretty tough. It was a really steep, very, very rutted up road. And yeah, I had it in four wheel drive and there was a couple spots where literally you're, you're driving along this narrow little ledge and it's a hundred feet down either side. And there's potholes that are or ruts that are, you know, like a foot and a half deep and the van's just like, it's just bouncing through them and you got to keep the tires moving or else if you get stopped, you're not getting back up again. You'd have to back down and try over. That was probably the closest one. Yeah, well, you're probably going to take uh, less chances, too, because you're by yourself in, in some of the areas you're fairly remote, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and even trying to get hauled out, if I had to call a tow truck or something, like, uh, it's it's not going to be cheap to get this thing pulled out of somewhere. So, right. yeah, I was probably a little more cautious than I would be if I was just in a pickup or something. Sure. going to throw a couple questions at you, like uh, Kevin Callan style, uh, just for shits and giggles here. <laughs> favorite roadside diner uh the omelet house in nevada okay. yeah I, I went there a few times it was good the favorite dish um just the bacon and egg skillet i think they called it it had yeah they have like a the potatoes and uh, all that kind of stuff in it yeah i'm a big are you, are you big on grits do they is, are they big on grits down there or is that more southeast mm -hmm. I think that's a little more southeast. I didn't. I saw grits on the menu a few times, but it didn't seem like everyone was eating it. I'm not really a big fan of grits. It feels like me neither, man. It's like eat. It's like eating. It's, uh, it's like porridge with sand in it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred yeah, percent. Right. I don't know. I, it's just not my thing. Yeah. Uh, longest travel day. Longest. Um, probably on the way home. Um going across through Colorado and Nebraska, Iowa, and then all the way up into Michigan. I think it was like, I think I did about 1,300 kilometers that day. What, what about your shortest travel day? What are them days where you, you start driving and you go, no, I'm just not feeling it, man. I'm pulling back <laughs> over again. You ever get any of those? Yeah, there was a few times where I just wanted a different view. And so I would just drive 20 minutes down the road and find another spot in the desert. Yeah. Nice to be able to have that option, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's beautiful. I love it. Oh, geez. I had another question. I'm, I'm trying to ramble off the, these little short one answer or one, one liners. They, um, Oh, okay. Th this is like right, right off the different topic. You, because you're traveling by yourself, right. And you are getting out the areas and, you find you find yourself battling loneliness at all out there, or is it? You yeah. said earlier you like the solo camp, or you like the solo trip. I I this do like it, but but the, it's definitely a battle for sure. There is, yeah. um, yeah, like a, just kind of a longing to hang out with somebody again, chat. Um, yeah, it's it, it for sure. What what? If, one thing that kind of surprised me was uh, I think it's people would refer to it as decision fatigue where you've got so many options in front of you that you just every day is, you know, what direction you're going to drive, how far you're going to drive, where are you going to stop, where are you going to eat, where are you going to camp? And there's just so many little decisions in every day that you get to a point where it's just like, Oh, I, I just want to not have to think for a little bit and not have to be like constantly aware of my surroundings and where I'm going. And, um, and I think having another person around or something would definitely maybe make that a little bit easier because you could deflect a bit, but yeah, it, it's a little bit weird. Cause like when you think about having your home, like if you go back to your house and once you close the doors and everything, that's your little sanctuary from the world. And the van became that, but it's just the world is just seems a lot closer a lot of the time. Mm -hmm.
So that takes a little bit more to get used to. Just not having like a solid, you know, a brick wall between you and the world and maybe a front lawn or, a, you know, you're in an apartment building or whatever it is. Um, now it's, you know, you're in a parking lot somewhere. You're, you can see a lot more people. This is, yeah, you don't have as much standoff from other people. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of the areas that you seem to go to uh, in, in the evenings got quite cool. I guess that's like they always say the desert gets pretty cold at night, right? So mm -hmm. obviously you're closing the door, you're putting the, the, the blinds up in the windows and stuff. Uh, you got a lot of like uh, Netflix uh, subscriptions or Amazon <laughs> Prime or what, what, what do you do to kill, kill an evening, you know, when you're... Or is it early yeah, bed so early it, to right? Yeah, I did end up actually starting to go with the sun. And, you know, so it's, it became rare that I was up past 10. And um, even when it was cool out down there, I could still sleep. So there's there's two little windows on either side of my bed, um, just little octagonal windows. And I would often sleep with one of those open. So I'd have to have a little bit of cool air coming in. and. Um, oftentimes I would wake up at like the first crack of dawn in the morning. Like that just, there's just a hint of glow over the skyline and like, okay, it's, uh, it's five in the morning. I guess I'll get up now. And I, I lost count of how many times I, I sat here with the door open, pretty cool or even cold, but like put a hoodie on and, and cover yourself up. And I would just sit here and watch the sunrise come up and mm -hmm. like, I probably watched the sun come up more times in the last four months than I have in my whole life combined. Cool. It just, yeah. And then by the time the evening came around, you know, maybe I'd, I'd catch up on the hockey scores or baseball or, or football, whatever it was. Right. And yeah, curl in the bed and read a little bit or something. And yeah. So it, okay. I noticed in particular in the evenings, if I wasn't driving a whole lot and I wasn't really going too far, that's when you'd be like, oh, yeah, I wonder what uh, what's happening back home or, you know, that that's when the loneliness would kick in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I think I kind of got used to it. Yeah. Well, your dad, your dad's in the chat, but a lot of connection to uh, to home while you're on the road. Yep. Yeah. Stayed in contact with friends and family and. Uh, my parents spent most of the winter down in Florida, so yeah, we would uh, we'd touch base and see how things were going and, and chat once in a while and um, yeah, just do what you can to stay in touch with people. But again, how many like I, I'm on the road by myself and that's my choice to do it, so I just kind of embraced it and make the best of it. Mm -hmm. Here, here's a test of your real character. Who who's your favorite hockey team? <laughs> Um, mm, uh, everyone's going to expect me to say Toronto, but I grew up in the Wayne Gretzky era. And so I was growing up as a, as an Oilers fan and I guess it would be the Oilers still. Oh, I thought you were going to pull the Sens or the Habs out of, out of your hat. So no, I'm a, I'm a no, least fan I was, myself, yeah. yeah, I was, I was a big fan of Gretzky back in the eighties and, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess it's still the Oilers. Cool. Very cool. Uh, somebody at, had asked a question. Now, earlier when, when I first started the show, I mentioned next week's show is going to be with uh, uh, talking about uh, the TVO series Trip in the French. Uh, yeah. th thanks to you, you uh, you set kind of set me up for that show. But somebody else was asking, uh, Jeff, Jeff McCullough was asking, what was your involvement with the upcoming TVO French River documentary? You got something to do with that? Uh, I, pardon me? You got something to do with that? Well, I had a very small role. I, I felt very fortunate. It was pretty cool to work with them. Um, so I got a email just cold from Mitch uh, asking how comfortable I was on the French River and how well I knew the river because he had watched one of my YouTube videos of me paddling the French. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to film down the old Voyageur channel. And that's my video was the whole channel. And so we chatted a few times and I said, yeah, I'm, I've run, you know, pretty much all the runnable rapids on the French, most of them numerous times and feel pretty comfortable. And so 
yeah, he offered for me to, to come down and I, I became kind of the chauffeur for their cameraman in all the white water sections. Oh, cool. And then also cool. the, the entire um, Old Voyager channel um, section of it. So, yeah, I've already I, I got to pre-screen the, the show already. And yeah. it's it's pretty spectacular. They got some incredible footage. Like, if you didn't want to go to the French River before, after you watch that, you definitely will. I I can vouch for that because I they they sent me the pre screen link as well, and I've been watching through it there. So it's a longer video, what just over two a shade over two hours, isn't it? I think it's almost three. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. So there there's so much, and I I find it's one of them videos that you know you you, you could watch segments of it. And just get right back into it again, right? Like, yeah, I, I watched that one trip into 185 train 185 like a whole ton of times, you know. And yeah, the Niagara River because it's like in my backyard almost. And then of course the Redo Canal, and they've got they've got a, like several of them series, uh, like a whole series of these episodes. So really cool. I'm actually looking forward to it, and uh, you know, looking forward yeah, to, so, to so whenever you it. see that whenever whenever you see the white water shots where you, you've got a like looking through the bow paddler's eyes. Yeah. That's the cam cameraman in the bow of my canoe, and then I'm in the back steering it through there. Oh, cool. So, okay. Yeah, we were able to run most of, I think, all but one set of rapids on the river. And, yeah, the whole Voyager channel. And, yeah, it was, they were just awesome guys to work with. It was really cool. Yeah. I'm pretty excited that they'll be on your show. Unfortunately, I'm going to be out paddling, I think, next week, so I'm not going to be here, but. Well, it's the beauty of YouTube, my friend. You can watch it back anytime you want, right? <laughs> yeah, I will. Yeah, Mitch is a really cool guy with tons of experience. So that was that was probably the coolest part of the whole thing was I just got to pick his brain as a like professional video producer to mm -hmm. see the kind of things he was looking for and what how he would compose a shot and put it together. And um, yeah, a ton of insight there. And I was just like, Ask, I think I kind of annoyed him after a while asking questions about how to do this and how to do that. And yeah, just like, shut up the battle. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's pretty cool. I, I really, like I say, I, I enjoy how they, they throw in all the interesting facts on screen and, and they, they cover history and, uh, you know, different aspects of the area of what make them unique, right? And that's a, yeah. a pretty cool thing. Even watching, like, I keep going back to the train 185 because I've done the Bud Car probably maybe four or five times and got off at various places. Bisco tasting like three times, right? Uh, Bisco is one of my favorite areas. I love that area. Bisco Tasty Lake, up to Indian Lake, Ramsey Lake, you know, and all those areas yeah. and then out to the, the Spanish, of course. But yeah, it's uh, it's all pretty cool to, to see that stuff and go, yeah, but I was showing uh, my friend, I go, yeah, man, I got off right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Get off of Pagansing. I've been off there. I've loaded back on the train there. So it's yeah, yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah, it's neat. It's uh, yeah. I I think if you've ever been to the French, you'll recognize a ton of the places there. Because yeah. they show it right from from Nipissing all the way through to Georgian Bay. Yeah. And like the the level of filming, like that that's one thing I was nervous about because I had this cameraman sitting in the the bow of my canoe. And he's got this big gimbal rig and, you know, $20,000 of camera equipment he's handling. And, you know, he's like, okay, let's go. And I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Did, did, did you sign a waiver that you weren't responsible if you actually dumped or wrapped? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, they they seemed to be okay with it if, you know, if the yeah. idea of, that they were going to get wet. But Yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. All right, that, that's cool to know that uh, you're... So you're you're behind the eyes. So you're not the eyes, but behind the eyes. Okay, we'll keep that in mind yeah. uh, when I get yeah. to that portion. I, I now now I want to um, paddle the French. I, I've never paddled the French, and it'd be really cool to take. You know, you could probably do that in what eleven to twelve days. Um. Relax. Yeah. Oh, easily in that length, probably yeah. less. Yeah. Um. Actually, they're Tunis and Brittany on Freaking Nature. They have a, a really good video where they do from top to the bottom, and then they paddle all the way to Killarney. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, I think they did all the way to Killarney in ten days. So okay, yeah, because the French, I think the whole trip would be like 120 kilometers or something like that. 
So is that, uh... shoot right at the beginning of the video, they, they, they mentioned how much it is too. I can't remember. Yeah, I think, I think it's 110 or 120. It's not as long as you might think it would be. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. No, I'm looking forward to that show. That's going to be a good one. But like I say, you'll have to tune in at a later point. Too bad you won't be around because it'd be cool to have you pop into the uh, the chat there at the end and talk about some of your yeah. experiences about that. Uh, yeah, it, it, I project. might be out by Tuesday night, but I I can't say for sure anyways. Planning a little yeah. canoe trip next week, and I got, I'm itching to get on the water. Cool. Uh, really quick for the people in the chat, we've got about, uh, well, as much as 10 minutes left in the show here. If anybody has a question they'd like to post across to uh, Tosh, please put it in now or forever hold your peace. And uh, if not, then we'll uh, we'll draw the show down to a close. So you mentioned uh, you're back in Ottawa now, Tosh, and uh, you're going to be mostly canoe tripping now for the summer, or do you have any other plans of heading back down in the future to the American Southwest? Is there something else down there, un unfinished business? There's a, a million things I would like to go back and see. And I, I, the, I live in the van full time now. So this summer I'll be canoe tripping, but still driving around, living in the van between trips. And yeah, there's, I, I'd love to go out and do some Western Canada stuff, um, Vancouver mm -hmm. Island and um, get down the, through Washington and Oregon. And uh, I barely scratched the surface with, with Utah uh, so much more Colorado I'd like to see. There's, there's just no end of places and tons of stuff I'd like to do. Go back and do some more hiking. I'd love to go back and do some fly fishing. I barely... New Mexico was a bit colder than I thought it was going to be, but it's incredible there with the mountains and everything. And mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's no end of <laughs> places I'd like to go explore still. Sure. How, how many kilometers do you figure you put on the van over this period uh, of time? Right around 20,000 round trip. Yeah. Kilometers or, or miles? 20,000 kilometers. kilometers. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Evan LaFave's asking, any pack rafting trips? That's one thing that's on my mind is to get a pack raft so I can just stow it in the back of the van and, you know, inflate it and, um, Steve from uh, Sulik 46, he kind of put that bug in my ear of like yeah. doing some, some pack rafting and bike pack rafting trips. And after last year's little experience on the, on the pack raft, it's, it's so much fun. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's definitely room for a pack raft in the van still at some point. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. When uh, when we had the uh, Toronto Outdoor Adventure Show, you actually flew in for the show. Where where were you? Where was the van when you did that? Your, I Arizona? so Nevada. Nevada was the cheapest place out of Vegas that I could find to fly back uh, to Ontario. So I left the van in their oversized parking lot and flew back in. And then we did. I came to the show and then the following weekend we did the little rat pack camp out, which was a blast. And, and I was back to, yeah, for Ontario for a few more days and then flew back down. So I, I think I was home for about two weeks. Yeah, man, I, I would have loved to have been at the rat pack meetup, but uh, between the Toronto outdoor adventure show, the weekend after being your, your outing, the weekend after that, I was in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin for canoe copia. Yeah. It's like I, I gotta be home sometimes, right? Where the yeah, wife's that was a big, stay gone, <laughs> stay gone. Yeah, that was a busy time of year, and that's yeah. like I, I asked everybody, you know, is this weekend work for you guys? Because it's the only weekend that I had yeah. that I was going to be back here. And yeah, I think it, I think it ended up being about a, a dozen, <laughs> maybe fourteen people. I think about a dozen showed up, and yeah, we had a good time. It was fun. Cool, cool. Well, you know what. One last question, and that's uh, what what are we going to be seeing from Tosh Self Propelled next? Do uh, you have more southern videos, or are you going to be getting right into the tripping videos now? Uh, the next one will be back in the canoe again. Um, yeah. yeah, I thought I might put together one more southern video, but I think I'm just going to get back in the canoe. I'm itching to paddle, so there that's you go. the next couple days is going to dig out all my gear and the storage locker and, and start packing for the summer. 
Cool. Well, hey, man, maybe we can make something happen this summer and uh, we can get out and dip a paddle for a weekend or something uh, somewhere. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes, I'd love for to. sure. Well, man, where where can anybody in the chat find you on social media? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, either through uh, probably the easiest would be Instagram. It's just Tosh Self Propelled on Instagram or through YouTube. Same thing. It's all Tosh Self Propelled. Cool. Good stuff. Well, man, thanks very much for joining. Uh, thanks for the lead for next week's show and uh, safe travels out there. It's good to, I, I enjoyed following your, your van exploits. I uh, would have loved to have seen more had you had the ability to do it, but uh, looking forward to see what you come up with this summer with your, uh, your paddling adventures again. Right on. Thanks so much, Dennis. I really appreciate you bringing me on. Good to have you on Tosh. Great to see you again. And, uh, just going to drop you into the basement, and we'll see you in a few short moments. Don't go away. All right. Thanks, everybody. Well, everyone, hopefully you enjoyed tonight's show with Richard Tosh from Tosh self Propelled. Uh, you know what? He's a great guy. I've uh, I've met Tosh on a couple of occasions at the Toronto Outdoor Adventure Show. Uh, everybody that I know that knows him always speaks very highly of him. So uh, he's got some great content. And, uh, yeah, man, I hope he keeps it coming. This uh, this YouTube life isn't an easy life, and uh, it's always great to see uh, this great content coming down the pipe for us all. Anyways, uh, just as a reminder, next week, so we are going to be joined by uh, uh, Mitch Azaria. Az That's it. Mitch Azaria from uh, TVO. Uh, he's the producer of Tripping the French, and we're going to be finding out all about uh, what it took to make this uh, video, I guess, including uh, stuff that... Uh, that Tosh had uh, done for them and, uh, you know, all kinds of neat things. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, the tripping series, just go onto YouTube, uh, punch in TVO and start watching some of their tripping videos, tripping to French, tripping to redo, tripping train 185. And there, there's a whole bunch of others on there. So it's, uh, it's really cool. You kind of get a gist of what the video is going to be all about. And uh, from what I've seen from the video itself, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a good well, it is a good one because I've actually been watching it, so it's it's, it's pretty neat. So, uh, just as a reminder too, uh, if anybody has any great ideas they'd like to see on the show, please do drop me an email at canoehound at gmail .com. Uh, For those of you who uh, became new members, thanks to uh, Mr. Bentley's uh, kind donation of five uh, channel memberships, uh, please drop me your mailing address and we'll get some stickers out to you there uh, for Canoe Hound Adventures. And uh, we'll show you what it's all about to be a uh, channel member. Anyways, have yourselves a great week, everybody. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you uh, hit that thumbs up already and we'll see you next week. Remember, keep the adventures alive. Talk to you.